And so today we're going to talk about um, code of, what codependency is, where it might come from, and kind of why. And just to let you guys know, this is the first in a monthly series of webinars for family members. So today's topic will just kind of brush the surface of the topic of codependency and attachment disorder, and then we'll get really, we'll dig deeper in um, in the coming months. So our next webinar is scheduled for April 28th at 6 p.m., which is a Tuesday. Marty, you want to go ahead and take it over? Okay, yeah. How many people do we have? Have people been kind of coming along as, as Megan's been doing the introduction? Yeah, um, I since I'm sharing my screen, I can't see. It looks like we have 24 people participating right now. Okay, so. awesome. That, that's great. I, I really appreciate everybody taking the uh, time out of their day to um, come and do this. This uh, is the first uh, uh, sort of rendition of this and uh, I spent a lot of time putting this together so what I wanted to do today was really give an overview um, but you'll see my version of an overview kind of starts from the uh, micro I'm a person that likes to go to the beginning um, I'm a musician so anytime I ever learned a song I always wanted to go back to the original version of it and so I'm gonna kind of do a, a, a linear uh, walk through time up to the current moment about sort of the development of attachment theory and uh, some of the things I've learned along the way since I've been working in this business since um, 2007. Oh Lord, that's a long time. Um, so Megan, I, I'll, uh, I might toggle back and forth between um, slides, just be ready, but go ahead and move forward. Okay. And uh, oh, you skipped the beautiful aspens. Oh, but sorry. That's okay. I thought that was just for, you know creative, <laughs> right. creative approach. Um, when I no worries. So go ahead to the next one. Um, I was just kind of making a joke there, but uh, I I really went back to trying to find the first um, uh, sort of statements in literature that even relate to attachment. And so of course I go way back to 1871 with. Charles Darwin, of course, The Descent of Man is the second publication that he was famous for. Uh, the Origin of Species, of course, is the first, but, um, but you know, he said it's often assumed that animals were in the first place rendered social and that they feel a consequence, they feel as a consequence uncomfortable and separated from each other and comfortable whilst, I love that word, um, together but it is more probable view that these sensations were first developed in order that those animals which would profit by living in society should be induced to live together. And so he's just trying to, um, uh, be, he's at the beginnings of putting together those instinctual urges that we all have. And um, for those animals which were benefited by living in close association, the individuals which took the greatest pleasure in society would best escape various dangers and whilst those that cared least for their comrades was solitary and would perish in greater numbers. And um, so this is kind of the first description of um, what social bonding um, means that um, when we are in that social bond, uh, we feel safer, we, we are, and basically that's part of our survival instinct that we're more likely to survive um, if we gather in like numbers, numbers of like kind. And um, there's a saying in the 12-step in the rooms of, of stay with the herd, and this kind of describes that. And so um, if you go ahead to the next slide, um, again, um, I kind of jump forward to 1950 and 1960. Um, there's a couple of people that I skipped over just because of uh, expediency. Um, of course, there's, there's two pretty major psychologists, the, um, uh, Freud, um, who uh, also talked about early relationships, but of course we all know he blamed everything on the mother, which we know, now know is wrong. Um, and then Alfred Adler is, um, well, mostly wrong because there's a two-part uh, caregiver situation for most people. Um, Alfred Adler is another one that talked a lot about uh, birth order and how that influences things. But the person that really started um, talking about the idea of attachment and attachment theory is John Bowlby. And there's a plethora of uh, research that he has done, but I pulled up one of the most basic um, uh, sort of uh, descriptions of 
uh, of attachment theory and the beginnings of it. And so what he did, he did a lot of experiments that I won't describe, but um, one of them was that he would, he would have an infant and a caregiver, a mother or a father, and he would separate them. And there's numerous um, uh, research uh, projects around this type of thing. Um, in general, it's called uh, the strange situation, and that actually that term actually came later. Um, but basically, they put, he put these infants in a strange situation and then um, watched what they did. And so they had three distinct behaviors in order. And of course, you can guess that the first one um, is protest, and we all know what that looks like in an infant. Um, <clears throat> it looks like crying and uh, throwing a fit and sort of making themselves known so that uh, their caregivers will will approach them and, and get in close proximity in order to, uh, you know, feel safe. Um, if that didn't happen, he would find that they would go into a place of despondence and then eventually into this place of detachment, which at first glance kind of seemed like um, negative uh, things. Um, but what he surmised in that is that the despondence and the detachment were also both survival mechanisms. So in the despondence, the infant would get quiet um, and still. And so what he figured is that this was still a survival skill. So um, an animal that's in the wild that is making a lot of noise by itself is much more likely to attract negative attention, of course. So then we're innately encouraged to be quiet if we feel like we're in trouble. And then the detachment piece um, is that in order to create a new bond, I have to be able to detach from the old bond. And so you saw that also as a, as a survival mechanism that um, if I'm able to detach, it opens me up to be able to take, uh, uh, take on new people as relationships, as social relationships, as protective relationships. So, um, and then in 1969, of course, he, he sort of states that he realized the enormous, support, the enormous importance for later relationships of the bonds that form between children and their caregivers. And so he's um, basically acknowledging that what happens in infancy and adolescence and those relationships with uh, uh, children and their caregivers has a direct influence on um, how they act in adulthood. And so uh, that came straight out of the handbook of attachment. And so um, we can go forward. Um, and this is one of my uh, uh, favorites because uh, I, I experienced a lot of this when I was uh, first starting out with uh, um, working at, I was working at Colorado State University at, uh, in their day program, stands for Drugs, Alcohol, and You. <clears throat> and um, so in that, in that uh, program, we would have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, kiddos, 18 to 20, mid-20s, who were in trouble with the conduct system for some reason. And so part of my job was to work with them, to try to help them to change their behavior. And it was usually around drinking or drug use, um, so they might get in trouble in the dorms. And so um, a lot of the complaints that those um, early adults had was that they didn't want to stop drinking or doing the behaviors that they had been doing because they were mostly afraid to lose their peer group. And so um, this kind of goes right back to Darwin that um, the fear of them losing their support system in their mind at that time, um, their caregivers, uh, was a bigger fear than trying to figure out how to keep you or trying to figure out how to stop using. So this basically kept them in that negative behavior that was not helpful for them. And so Bandura sort of gave these four uh, processes for how we develop socially. <clears throat> the first, um, uh, we have to be able to uh, pay attention. We have to be able to see what's going on. Um, then we have to have the capacity to retain that information. And so we're sort of, uh, you know, uh, we're observers by nature. And this happens from the moment we're born. We are observing things and learning things as we go. Um, 
and watching what works and what doesn't work. Um, and we take data as we go. And so if I'm an early adult in college and I see that all my friends are drinking and having fun, I make a, I place meaning on that, that this is how I keep my social group. Um, I'm going to want to continue that behavior in order to keep that group in order to not be afraid of um, being isolated and potentially um, in trouble. So he also said that we have to have the ability to reproduce that behavior. So, um, and willingness, right? So I have to be able to actually reproduce the behavior I observed to get the outcome that I hopefully um, saw happen before. And then at some point, um, I have to have motivation for that to happen, right? I have to have motivation to actually try that behavior. Um, so then it becomes a trial and error of um, doing what I watched and seeing what happens. Um, and then taking more data on that. So you can imagine um, when those kiddos were asked not to drink, they really framed that as um, I'm going to lose my support system, I'm going to lose my peer group. And so they had high motivation to continue doing that behavior and were very resistant to suggestions otherwise. Um, so if you go forward for a second, Megan, um, and I might toggle back and forth a little bit. So then I kind of jump forward um, into more what we're talking about. So you can kind of see this timeline where it's, it's about survival and then it's about attachment. Then we start to see how those attachment um, behaviors kind of start to, to affect a person later in life. And uh, Wojtitz, she um, worked a lot and was an advocate for at the time and around 1983, <clears throat> when the book Adult Children of Alcoholics was published, um, she was a proponent for actually beginning the movement um, in working with addiction as a family disease, as a family condition. Um, and of course, Alfred Adler had been talking about that for some time, uh, Bowlby and, and, and um, uh, Bandura also. And so she worked mainly with the adult children of alcoholics. And so she found these traits that adult people typically had who were adult children of alcoholics. So that's somebody who grew up in an alcoholic household um, or drug or, um, you know, it could be a number of different things. It could be a person who's bipolar. But if you can just imagine... Um, <clears throat> Growing up in a, a situation where uh, uh, a mom or a dad or a caregiver somehow is not present the way they would normally be. And so the way that this affects a kiddo um, and how it turns up in adulthood is what Wojtas was, was mainly interested in. And so what she found was uh, that um, ACOAs, for short, um, they tend to guess at what normal behavior is. And the reason for that is that they don't actually know what normal is in relation to um, other people because their normal is actually fairly dysfunctional, but to them, they don't know it's dysfunctional. So when they get into adulthood and they start to interact with other people, um, they're not exactly sure what normal is because their version of normal um, is quite different than what they've experienced. Um, they tended to have merciless self-judgment. Um, they take things very seriously, um, uh, very approval seeking. And if you can imagine um, a child say that there's a father that um, is absent, <clears throat> um, when kiddo doesn't know and there's this sense of uh, um, unknowing as far as uh, um, what is going to come home and how they're going to show up and being unpredictable, they start to learn how to judge and modify their own behavior in order to control the problem that might be coming through the door that night. So um, those kiddos will, will learn to read situations and, um, and see what happens. So in, in other words, they're, they're doing the same survival strategies but they're just trying to do it by controlling this um, uh, variable in their lives. 
Um, the same thing might happen typically if, uh, um, like say if a mom is, uh, is absent in some way, whether she's an alcoholic or not, um, or whether maybe she's bipolar or depressed, same thing with the dad. Um, but if the mom becomes absent, then the kiddo starts to um, do parental behaviors that would not normally be asked of them. So you see like 12 and even younger, 12 and 13 year olds doing their own laundry, taking care of their younger siblings. And they start to control their situation and the chaos that they see. And when they do that, it makes them feel um, safe. And so they learn as a result that how they survive is to try to control their environment. Does that make sense? I don't know if every, is everybody hearing me okay still? Yeah, for sure. Okay. I can hear you. I, if, anybody has, if anybody has questions along the way as I'm kind of going through this, um, I have to admit I'm the kind of person that's more interactive. So uh, just talk, talk, talk is not uh, necessarily my uh, way of interacting and disseminating information. So if there's something that pops up for you as I'm going, um, please just um, type it in the in the comment box and I'll try to address it as we go. Um, but some of these other traits that Wade has found was um, uh, they're very impulsive. Uh, they have difficulty having fun. Um, the one that kind of uh, stuck out in my mind was that they're extremely loyal even in the face of evidence when that loyalty is undeserved. Um, so uh, this is where you see moms and dads, um, husbands and wives who are involved with an addict or an alcoholic in some way. Um, they stay and they stay and they stay in that relationship despite the things that were happening um, with their addict or alcoholic loved one. Um, despite all of the evidence that their loyalty is undeserved, they stay. Um, and part of that is just survival of the species because there is actually a, uh, there's a, there's an emotional bond, there's a psychological bond, and there's a physiological bond between people, um, uh, especially um, caregivers and their kiddos between siblings, between husbands and wives, and, um, and other relationships. So um, when that bond is so strong, it's very difficult for somebody to um, sort of cut their losses, so to speak, and, and hold up boundaries and really um, take care of themselves. So um, really quickly, if so, you don't mind me yeah. asking, um, someone submitted a question. I see it. Okay, great. Does if my parents had alcoholic parents, but my parents are not alcoholics, can these traits be seen to be passed down um, to me, second generation eldest child? So if, if my parents had alcoholic parents, right, but my parents were not, so sorry, I have to read it to myself so I understand the question better. So basically, like the grandparents, right, were alcoholics. Yes. And so then the parents grow up in that relationship. So yeah, they can have learned those um, uh, coping strategies that, that ACOAs learn, you know, um, like controlling situations. And so then likely that could be passed down to another child. So all of those things, I mean, we know things like, um, you know, um, abuse and alcoholism and drug addiction can be passed down generationally. So absolutely these kind of things can get passed down if they don't get interrupted. And so the, the, the problem with that is, um, that's a great question, by the way. Uh, the problem is those, those um, uh, what, how do I want to say it? Those traits don't get intervened on unless there is something wrong with them. Or so, for example, what I mean by that is that I learned these coping strategies as a kiddo, and then sometimes I get into adulthood and those traits don't work so well. So unless somehow that behavior is not working, there's no real reason for me to change it. So in that way, those things can get passed down generally, generationally, absolutely. Um, 
let's go forward. Awesome. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, and, and that's one that I don't hear often, but it's something that is, um, you know, important to be addressed because also that alcoholic gene can, can skip a generation, right? So then the, the children of that person could be doubly at risk, right? So um, Wojtis publishes her book and then along comes um, uh, Melody Beatty. And you'll see later, I just, I just put her last name in, but Melody Beatty is one of the main, she's the one who coined the, the term codependent. And the most famous, uh, most well-known famous book of hers is Codependent No More. That was 1986. And um, in that, she says a codependent person is one who has let another person's behavior affect him or her and who is obsessed with controlling that person's behavior. So um, this was really another landmark book in the world of uh, um, sort of uh, um, this idea that I, that I will probably talk about later, which is this idea of co-recovery. So I really think that um, the, the recovery process gets focused on with the addict or the alcoholic much more than it gets focused on with the person that's their loved one. And I'll, I'll uh, share with you later in one of the later slides, I kind of use the term a tendency to codependency. And I just say that kind of as a joke because um, um, I don't want people to think that uh, codependency is this, uh, you know, like I tell people, um, addiction is not necessarily a curse and codependency is not necessarily a curse either. It just means I have to pay to pay attention to certain things in order to uh, overcome them. Um, so, but if you think about an ACOA, an adult children of an alcoholic who grows up learning how to control their environment, their siblings, and their parents, they they come into adulthood and they meet somebody, whether it's a man or a woman, um, and they tend to try to find somebody that needs help. So it, it's kind of a, um, you know, something I, I also say a lot, which is when um, people who need to help find people who need to be helped. And that's why a lot of times we find people that have these codependent tendencies uh, um, typically find people that have problems somehow in their lives that need help. Um, and people who need help in, in turn look for people who need to help. So it's like a match made in heaven, so to speak. Um, um, but then if you could go forward one more slide, please. Um, um, then comes along uh, and, uh, a woman named Pia Melody, and she's um, one of the uh, most pronounced uh, voices in codependency. And, and in 89, she comes out with a book called Facing Codependence. So when you think about Wojtas and then Beatty and then Melody, and I think it's funny because two of the main authors in codependency, one is named Pia Melody and the other one is named Melody Beatty. So it shouldn't be too hard to, to remember, but um, Pia Melody comes a little bit more from the um, sort of therapeutic side of things. And um, she goes a little bit more in depth, but in Facing Codependence, and by the way, Facing Codependence is an awesome book. And it also comes with a workbook along with it. So uh, um, we can talk a little bit more about that later because I kind of have good news and bad news when it comes to this whole thing. But um, in, 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 in Facing Codependence, uh, PM Melody uh, just kind of has five sort of uh, uh, traits or signs that a person might be codependent. And um, they, they might have trouble with self-esteem, they, they definitely, in my um, experience, have uh, a hard time setting functional boundaries. And this is a big part of what will, pre uh, will be a later presentation of how to set boundaries. And, and part of that problem is, is I, if, I'm a, if I'm a person that needs to help people, me setting a boundary is me saying that I'm not going to help them. So it's very difficult for me to set that boundary because it's basically um, the thing that I need to do. It's my addiction is to help people. And so if I set a boundary that I'm not going to help, that doesn't feel very comfortable for me. So I have trouble setting boundaries. 
Um, um, and in that, I'm going to skip down to the last one, experience, uh, experience and expressing their reality moderately. So this kind of goes with a setting of boundaries because um, people who tend this direction, they will either be completely attached or completely detached. So they will either say, I'm totally there with you or I'm totally not with you. And they don't have a middle ground of how to set those boundaries. And so um, you'll, you'll see somebody like uh, say, I'm done with you, you're cut off. And so, um, and then of course, the person who's struggling with drugs or alcohol is like, well, what's, what's going on with that? All of a sudden you, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, wait to help me. And now all of a sudden you're not, you're just completely cutting me off. So that doesn't feel good. Or they will say, um, uh, uh, I'm gonna pay for everything. And that doesn't feel good either. So the, like this moderate boundary setting is always a problem or they will set a boundary that they can't keep, right? So um, for example, like the, the, the extreme of I'm not gonna, um, I'm cutting you off, um, that usually doesn't last, right? Because I can't just not be there to help um, because there's a fear factor in there. And this is true for a lot of, addicts and alcoholics is that they, they sort of have a, uh, uh, they've got a key to the whole process in that the codependent's biggest fear is that if I don't help, they might leave the planet, they might die. So in lieu of that, I would much rather help and watch them suffer than try to um, put up these boundaries and try to get them to um, get their own help. So, so there's a way that addicts keep codependence hooked in. Um, and of course, taking care of their own needs and wants. Um, codependence help people to a fault to their own deficit. So um, let's go ahead one more. I'm sort of watching the time here too. So then Melody Beatty in 2009 comes out with a book called The New Codependency. And um, in that she um, talks about, and it's a great book as well, but she talks about how she sort of modifies um, the uh, definition or what her perception of codependency is. Um, and in that book, she says, the behaviors associated with codependency from controlling to caretaking um, are behaviors that saved our lives when we didn't know what to do. So, um, She's kind of saying that all of those um, survival strategies that I learned um, as a child, whether I was an ACOA or not, I still learned these survival strategies. And those behaviors become my lifesaver into adulthood. And so um, she also kind of talks about that, um, uh, you know, one of the, I guess, uh, beliefs about codependents, they will say that, oh, they're overachievers. She thought that was kind of a trite um, way to put things and didn't like the sound of it. And she said, actually, they're super achievers. Um, and how they super achieve, um, and she alludes to this later in the book and, and my sort of takeaway from it. And, and one of the ways that I sort of describe how to assess whether a person is codependent or not is that it's, I look at their parental instincts and whether we have kids or not, we all have parental instincts. We all have caretaking instincts. And so it's parental instincts overdone. For example, codependents tend to overdo supporting, problem solving, loving, detaching, helping, fixing, encouraging, teaching, protecting, compromising, accepting, nurturing. So if you can imagine those natural and normal um, parental traits done to an extreme, you know, like if I overlove somebody, it starts to feel smothering and doting. If I over support or over problem solve, it starts to feel like to the other person that they don't believe I can do it on my own. And so then the person uh, sort of responds in kind. Um, they over help, they help too much. And then the person who is always being helped never actually has the confidence to try to um, uh, um, learn things on their own. Overfix, over encourage, 
especially the overprotecting. Um, um, and when I was in, um, I taught music for a while here in here in Fort Collins, and um, I, I taught an orchestra class and a couple of them, and um, I experienced helicopter parents, right? And so these parents would protect their child at any cost, even if they were in the wrong. And so it was kind of uh, um, frustrating and off-putting for me at the time. But of course, when I went back to school and started looking at some of this stuff, I started to understand um, why they were doing that sort of thing. So this is a really good barometer for me. Um, um, I just overdo my parental instincts. And the hard part about this is that um, for alcoholics or addicts, it's a fairly black and white, um, well, for the most part, black and white task, right? Um, how do I, um, I, I either am using or I'm not using if I'm an addict. So it's pretty black and white. But for a codependent, it's how do I support this person but not enable them? And so it's not such a black and white task to figure that type of thing out. And that'll be something um, that's obviously a longer conversation. But this is one of the things that codependents struggle with is um, I can't just cut them off and I still need to help, but I don't want to overhelp. And so they get lost in these, um, uh, this sort of uh, circle of trying to figure out what is, a, what is the best supportive behavior. And the thing that convolutes it even more is that the addict changes. So something that is supportive one minute to the addict um, might be enabling the next minute. So um, one thing I say, uh, no matter which kind of recovery you're in, um, it's a moving target. So recovery is definitely a moving target all the time. Um, go ahead to the next. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking too much. So if there's a question or something, just put it up there and I'll watch. Um, so yeah, here's my kind of joke slide, uh, a little bit of a joke. The ten, you know, we all have kind of a tendency towards codependency because we all um, uh, we like to help. In fact, one of the main tenets of um, the twelve-step programs, especially in AA and NA, is the idea of service work. This ten, this uh, uh, sense of being selfless instead of selfish. Um, with codependents, it's a little bit different because they are over selfless. Right. Um, so in 2016, and I, th I think the, the CODA book um, came out, the Codependence Anonymous book, I believe was 2013. I'm not sure, but um, I can look. But 2016 was the last publication of it. And so they um, sort of assess and present these five different uh, traits of people. And one is denial patterns. And the thing that I'll say about that is that um, in my experience, uh, it's much harder to have a, a person who is a family member of an addict or alcoholic, it's much harder to get them, uh, encourage them to go to Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous or Adult Children of Alcoholics than it is to get an addict to go to AA or NA. Um, there's a high level of denial and I mean and if you can imagine a parent might say well I'm not the one that put the drugs in their mouth and I'm not the one that or the alcohol in their mouth and I'm not the one that put the drugs down their throat um, I don't have any part in this so there's a high pattern of denial um, and part of that is kind of like these perfectionistic traits that come out um, they have low self-esteem patterns and the reason for that is they base their self-esteem on what their addict is doing. So a lot of times I'll ask somebody who kind of is struggling with this, how are you doing? And they'll say something in the order of, well, I'm doing great because Johnny is doing well, or I'm not doing so good because Johnny's relapsing again. Um, so they base their well being on how another person is doing. Um, Compliance patterns, control patterns, and avoidance patterns, which we've already talked about. So these are like just some traits in the, in the CODA book that um, is actually very good that you can read about. So if you go forward one more, um, Megan, um, we don't have to read through all of these, but this is kind of a, a comprehensive list of various websites that I found that you can kind of um, 
take a peek at. And you can see that there's no definitive um, sort of criteria for codependency. Um, everybody has their own recipe, um, if you will. Um, there's usually a level of anxiety and stress that goes along with it. Um, uh, of course, I'm looking at this last one, denying one's own needs, thoughts, and feelings. So they, they um, will definitely um, put others' well-being before their own. Um, they have a hard time saying no. Um, they, they show emotional reactivity, and that is shown by either underreacting to something that really needs a reaction or overreacting to something that's not that big a deal. And so, again, that goes back to the Pia Melody uh, uh, when she talked about uh, inability to express my reality moderately. So, um, of course, intimacy issues. Um, and mainly because they have never uh, or had little, at least, example of what um, healthy intimacy looks like. So they guess at things, as, as uh, Wade had said, you know, they guess at what normal is. Um, um, and they feel compared to take care of people, you know, poor boundaries we already talked about. Um, so um, if we go ahead to the next one. Um, so then um, comes along one of my favorite people, and Susan Johnson. Um, she has a book that's called uh, uh, Attachment Theory and Practice, Emotionally Focused Therapy with Individuals, Couples, and Families. Um, so she um, is the, um, or, or emotionally focused therapy is sort of the brainchild of Susan Johnson. And in 2019, she came out with this book. And what she says in it is focus on the focus on the underlying process. So this is actually kind of a training uh, manual for for therapists, but it's also a great read for anybody. Um, but she says that we should probably focus on the underlying process, not just the development of a disorder, but the way people function when thriving and when dysfunctional. And it's really interesting that she says it that way because to me, I think when somebody is, um, I. Sometimes when I'm doing these behaviors that turn out to be negative, it looks like I'm thriving when I'm really not. So there's a deception in this. And then also um, back in the previous slides when um, uh, they said, I kind of guess at what normal is, like the person isn't actually sure what function or dysfunction is at the time. But what she's really doing is acknowledging everything that Bowlby and um, Darwin and Bandura said is that we have to look at the development um, of what happened in the past that is informing a person's current behavior. So one thing I say a lot to people is like, the most important relationship that I'm interested in if we're doing therapy is um, the relationship that you have with yourself, because that's the relationship that informs everything else on the outside. So um, if I've learned to have a certain type of relationship with myself, that informs how I am with other people. So, um, so if you go to the next slide, um, the uh, um, you know the, this is kind of the good news, bad news part is that um, to work on these things, um, you know the, the good news is there is help, of course. Um, the bad news is, um, is uh, that people typically don't like it, and um, and and the help that happens is that codependents or people who struggle with this tendency. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the remedy, the, 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 the way to work on this stuff is basically the same thing that alcoholics and addicts do, which is this version of self-reflection, um, compassionate self-assessment, and then working on what traits am I doing that are working and are good for me and what traits am I doing that are not working and are not good for me. Um, so you know, I put up the first step here in the CODA book, which is we admitted we were powerless, powerless over others, that our lives had become unmanageable. And you can tell that it's exactly the same as the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous, except they replaced alcohol with the word others. Um, here is a list of some uh, uh, help areas that I typically refer people to. Um, one may or may not fit for a person, but Al-Anon, has been around almost as long as AA. And um, it's where people who have this trouble find other people who have this trouble. 
as in codependent. Yeah, Naranon is another great group for those with, yeah, so Naranon, thank you for reminding me of that, by the way, Lori. Um, Naranon is to nar uh, Narcotics Anonymous as Al-Anon is to AA. So I'm, I apologize, I should have put that in there. Um, so, um, but those, both of those programs are sort of like the lay programs. Um, you know, and um, I won't go into the story of how Al-Anon started, but it was basically Bill Wilson's wife. And then the other um, sort of codependent offshoots of that mimicked the 12 steps of AA, and that's where that came from. Um, and then, of course, Codependence Anonymous is a little more official version. The ACOA um, is a little bit harder to find, but um, there is some great literature on that stuff. And if you've had parents um, or if you know somebody who, who's had parents who were sort of absent in that way. It's a great thing. Now, some people kind of veer away from the 12-step-ish kind of thing, which I'm okay with. Um, uh, in my own sort of recovery, I have what I tell people is like a tapestry of help, you know, and um, so if you want to, if a person wants to see a private therapist, I always advise them do it with a therapist that is experienced and well-versed in codependency and addiction. Um, don't do somebody, uh, don't work with somebody who's like sort of playing around. Um, if they don't have experience, don't work with them. And I tell people as a, as a um, client of a therapist or a clinician, you are the um, customer. And so ask them what their experience is, ask them what their belief system is, ask them where they come from, where they were trained in codependency and addiction. And that's something that people don't typically do um, because they're just so glad to get somebody on the line a lot because a lot of the people are, um, a lot of the clinicians that I know that are good are busy, right? Um, and so there's other topic-oriented therapy groups that um, a lot of uh, clinicians are now starting to do. I mean, right now, of course, here we're doing a group on Zoom. So everything is Zooming these days um, because of our current situation. Um, but finding another uh, group of people, and basically the reason AA worked and the way that the reason there were all these offshoots, um, you know, there's grief groups, there's uh, suicide groups, there's survivors of uh, suicide groups, there's depression groups, anxiety groups, just fill in the blank and there's a group for it. Um, they realized that people with like problems, um, when they uh, hung out together and talked, they tended to um, feel relief in the systems of whatever they were struggling with. Um, so I always encourage people to try to find a, uh, um, a topic-oriented group to the thing they're struggling with. And I think there's one, maybe two more slides. Great. We do have a uh, question submitted in the Q&A spot, but we can wait until the end um, to answer it quickly. The, uh, yeah, was the person that talked about Naranon? No, it says, um, the question is, as adult, ch as adult children are having career or financial or relationship problems due to the current pandemic, it's very triggering for the formerly very codependent parents. Any tips? Oh, I don't see that one. Can you read it to me again? Yeah, so as adult children are having career, financial, relationship problems due to the current pandemic, it can be, or it is very triggering for formerly very codependent parents. Do you have any tips for dealing with those code, very codependent parents during this stressful time? So, um, yeah, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to answer that. Um, and I'm just going to say this last slide real quick. Um, I just put this on there because attach, there isn't a, a, such a thing as adult attachment disorder. And um, the current Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders does not recognize adult attachment. Um, most of the attachment um, diagnoses are for children five and under. Um, but here are sort of, you can see the congruency of this because I wanted to bring in that clinical piece. Um, and uh, so to the question, um, so what, what I hear from the question is that, um, you know, with the thing that's going on right now, um, uh, people are getting uh, financially stressed, they're getting emotionally stressed, and um, there are codependent parents of those people that are sort of uh, basically acting out. Does, does that sound right? 
Yeah, exactly. They're being triggered by all of this. Right. So they're being triggered. And, and this is a great question because, um, uh, and we'll do this in one of the ensuing um, sessions, but basically they're getting triggered and they're in the process of relapse. They're in the process. So if you think about an addict who um, is uh, in the process of relapsing, they're thinking about drinking or using, and the codependent, for example, if they're in their process of relapse, the behavior that they don't want to do is to enable their addict. Um, so they're in the process of relapse. So what I encourage people to do is if you have um, the communication skills and relationship built up with these people, um, whether they're your parents or someone else's parents or maybe their friends, um, um, the first thing I do is ask permission. If there's something that you're noticing, um, ask permission to talk to them about it. And then if they say yes, you can tell them, I am noticing you are doing such and such and such. And it, sound, it seems like you're kind of worried that your loved one isn't able to figure out how to take care of themselves and all this. Um, so I would encourage that person that's feeling the pressure of the codependence to learn to draw their own boundaries. And for the codependence to allow the, their, their dependent to try to figure it out on their own and wait to solve their problem until they're asking for help. Um, excuse me a second. Um, uh, Sorry, somebody was calling me and I got distracted. So um, this idea that um, uh, sort of in, in this recovery process, uh, whoever gets better first, the other person starts to feel uncomfortable. Um, so if the addict starts to uh, get better first, then they start to draw boundaries with uh, um, they're codependent. They'll say, I don't need your help and I don't need your money, for example. Um, and then that will make the codependent person feel a little bit uh, uh, unsettled. And then if the codependent person is the person that gets better first, then they tend to draw the boundaries and they'll tell the addict, I'm not going to pay for rent or I'm not going to support you in the way that I used or, or I'm not going to enable you in the way that I used to. And that will make the um, addict or alcoholic feel more uncomfortable. So I think um, this question is complicated because um, there are co-occurring disorders that happen with addiction. And so sometimes I'm dealing with somebody that has a mental health disorder. And by the way, that happens in codependency too. Um, you saw all the, the lists about uh, um, anxiety and, and, and stress and depression. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a there's a lot to to kind of sort out in that question. I wish I could see it in front of me. Though so for some reason, some of those aren't coming through, Megan, or maybe it's, it's up, in the no, Q and A section through. instead of in the chat, um, which is different. But I can copy okay. it in there if you want. I, um, we have a few minutes left, a couple minutes left. So do you want to move forward to the next slide quickly? Yeah, I think that's. Uh, go ahead. Oh, just more. So, yeah, I just. I just wanted to point out, you know, that the DSM, so the, the, the diagnostic manual that all clinicians use does not right now, um, you know, acknowledge adult attachment disorder. And that's what I really believe codependency is. It's a version of attachment disorder. And so this last slide is just a list of <clears throat> some of the books that I took this information from um, that you can, uh, these are all great books. These are all books that I have in my library right now. Um, I don't expect you to go out and buy the handbook of uh, attachment because that's not fun to read, but um, are there any other questions before we um, sign off? And as I'm waiting for something to come up, I'll just say that, you know, those topics at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm sort of working through what a logical progression would be. Um, to uh, kind of either work on communication or the idea of co recovery. Um, so I'll work that out and um, uh, try to make a freestanding um, talk, but I sort of wanted these all to build on each other. So any questions or comments? 
Yeah, and if you'd like to hear more in-depth information about a specific topic for the next webinar, feel free to uh, type in the chat any ideas or anything specifically you want to hear about as well. Um, and, j and I'll go over where the chat is really quickly, just in case no one, uh, you haven't found it. It should be at the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat bubble and it says chat under it. And you can either chat just to us or to everyone if you want. Um, so you can remain anonymous if you have any questions. Marty, I have a question. Um, all of sure. this just is, you know, resonating with me and it's just funny to kind of think about where I have, where I, how far I've come in the past few years of my own kind of journey with all of this. Um, what books, mm -hmm. what's the number one book you would recommend? On the oh, list? all of them. <laughs> I'm <laughs> definitely a synthesizer. So um, probably, um, you know, uh, probably the codependency book. I mean, all of these are great books. So um, as far as like, what's the best one, you can go on Amazon and read a few, uh, read a little bit of each one. But that's what I really wanted to do is like show everybody sort of the progression of sort of how the understanding of, of attachment and codependency sort of went through the, um, through the years. And um, I mentioned some of these healthy boundaries, support versus enabling. Yeah, that, that's uh, both of those are probably good topics to go to next. Um, communication styles, but um, thank you. I appreciate that suggestion. Are we automatically registered for the whole series? Um, I will let Megan answer that one. I'm sure she has everybody's email that we can re um, uh, reinvite for the next one. Um, yeah, you're not automatically registered for the entire series, but our next webinar is uh, April 28th, which is a Tuesday at 6 p.m. So I will send out the link to register afterwards. So with the recording, I'll also send you the link to register for the next one in advance. Appreciate that question. Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate everybody being here. Thank you so, so much. Um, it, it's a it's a little bit odd talking um, without having a lot of interaction, but I hope it, I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm oh, looking at this last. Yeah, these um, are great topics. Living with living with an alcoholic, how to work with other family members that are str struggling with understanding. Yes, definitely yeah. topics that you know I I still have questions about too. I I see those, and I see the one about communication uh, before that from Jennifer. So yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you for those. Any other um, quest, uh, questions before we go? I just want to thank everybody for being here and spending an hour with me and also um, putting up with the technical uh, uh, glitches that we had at the beginning. Thanks, Diane.